Hi, everybody, and welcome back to yet another cracking installment of the Map Round Show. This is the Built in California series where I'm connecting you to amazing founders uh, doing amazing things in the bright lights of Colorado where it's all white and snowy outside. Uh, with me on the line uh, is none other than Luke Johnson, the founder and CEO of Neat Labs. Welcome to the show. Thanks. Glad to be here, Matt. Cool. So uh, you've got uh, quite a um an, an, an interesting background cluttered with a lot of overachievement <laughs> so i'd love for you uh just to kick us off uh luke with uh or for our audience who haven't had the chance to get to know you but about your background and kick us off with the origin story to to neat labs sure so i won't go back to my days growing up in rural vermont but uh basically started um in this industry um kind of during the subprime era evaluating all the larger institutions that were really active in creating subprime loans and securitizing them into mortgage-backed securities and um, even servicing those loans subsequently. But um, basically my job was to determine if people were making good loans and whether they were packaging them correctly in mortgage-backed securities, whether they were shorting their own stuff. So it's a pretty interesting time to be in the market, of course. And so Got to see a lot of what went wrong in the lead up to the crisis, of course, um, and uh, kind of was in involved in all of that mess. And so um, I really left the industry when I needed to sort of take a shower um, and, and rinse off the, the dirt. Um, but um, really, you know, did M&A for a while in the U.S. and Latin America and came back to the industry uh, to start NEAT. Um, and the idea for NEAT was incredibly simple. It was basically every other segment of consumer finance had evolved. It had become really modernized, a one-shot process where you can basically apply for a loan and receive funding the same day, whether it was a personal loan, an auto loan, a student loan, et cetera. Um, but mortgage had drifted the opposite direction since the crisis. And strangely, um, even though it was slowed down, it didn't get better in any meaningful way for consumers. Um, there was no more certainty in the transaction. There was no more education, interestingly, in the transaction, meaning you know, consumers weren't educated about affordability or income requirements or how much savings they need to, give in a, to afford a given you know, purchase amount or whatever. Um, and so like, basically, not only had we learned nothing from the subprime era, but there was no modern technology to make for a, an efficient, kind, um, and um, you know, non-stressful consumer journey. So uh, we created Neat with that idea of making loans in one session, providing education along the way, so that consumers weren't stuck in things they couldn't afford or um, uncertain about what they could afford. Got it. So you were just describing to me this idea of the one session transaction. Um, what is the one session transaction and how does this relate to the problem that you guys are solving? So in mortgage, it's kind of an interesting multi-step process for a consumer um, that if someone were to explain, you'd sort of walk away pretty quickly from the transaction because it'd be too daunting. Um, but basically, you know, the, the way mortgage works today in the traditional environment is you apply for a loan, you get a pre-approval that's meaningless, and 50% of your pre-approvals don't really pull through to the stated interest rate or the stated down payment or even qualify you for to close on a loan. Um, and then subsequently, you wait for three weeks while your, your mortgage bank asks for documents. They look at those documents. They ask for more documents. They look at those and then they approve you typically three to eight weeks later. Um, the problem with that is that you've left your own old home, you're bidding on a new one, and you could be homeless in the transaction, of course, um, if it doesn't come through like you expect. Um, and it's incredibly stressful because your home is your biggest purchase that you'll ever make in your life. And so um, not knowing if you're approved and what your down payment is and what your interest rate kind of are, are really big, 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 burly problems for many, many people out there. And so what we thought we would do is not only take in a quick application like the likes of a blend or a better, 
but actually produce the loan in real time. That means underwriting it in front of the client and giving them feedback. So as they're telling a client is telling us about their income, we say, is this income sufficient? And what is the goal post to be able to afford the, the, um, the loan amount you're looking for? Um, or if we're asking someone about their savings account, we ask, we tell them, here's the goal post of how much savings we're looking for you to have in order to afford this, this given purchase. Um, and what that does is it then connects that to all the documents we need to validate all of that information in one straight through process so that it's not going back and forth with you during a very long and arduous journey. Um, we average a half a day to a day in underwriting, which is just um, so unheard of in our industry that it's not believed. Um, so, you know, it's so, so wildly different than what's out there that, um, you know, folks in the industry tend to doubt it, that it could possibly be. Mm. So you were um, explaining to me just how big this market actually is. And, and you were describing to me that like if you took all of consumer finance and then multiplied that by 10, the largest segment is the mortgage segment. And, and every year, roughly $4.3 trillion is lent to consumers. Would you say that that is the market opportunity that uh, that you guys are going after in terms of its size? Yeah. So it and it's only multiplied by four, I guess. But um, still, it's a it's a pretty big market. So it's and it's really every bucket. It's personal loans, auto loans, student loans. It's you know every single one of those buckets together multiplied by four still equals mortgage. Mortgage is the U.S. mortgage is the largest consumer market on the planet. And so, you know, for consumer finance market on the planet, it is just so vastly and overwhelmingly large, even in a downturn, that are, there is just massive opportunity in this space. Unfortunately, that opportunity is matched by complexity. So the U.S. mortgage market is not so simple. It's not like creating a personal loan where you can take six to 10 bits of data and give somebody a loan. Instead, it's, it's massively, you know, complex in how we... Um, determine how to lend and calculate all of our calculations behind the scenes and then validate that with documentation and all the rest. So it's, there's a lot more to the process of lending in the U.S. mortgage market, but it's worth getting after because it's so, so big. Um, there are many software companies that service this space um, that, are, that are super highly valued, of course. Um, because, you know, banks tend to stick pretty heavily to their core software. You know, they don't, they don't change that frequently. Um, and so it's, it is a huge market opportunity and more meaningfully, more, cons many, many consumers are obviously impacted by this. So anybody that is bought a home in the United States, which is, you know, quite a few, um, are, are really touched in a pretty meaningful way by this, this style of transaction because it is the largest transaction they'll make. And it's not like getting a personal loan. You get a mortgage and you've got a 30-year loan that's, that's your biggest, biggest payment. And so getting it right um, and without having to refinance out of a bad loan with too high of fees or what have you kind of matter to, it, it matters to, to all, all consumers really. So it's a, it's a pretty meaningful transaction. It's how most people build wealth in this country. Um, and so we think it's worth getting after. So one of the interesting uh, things that I observed when I moved to Denver was uh, if I, you know, me and my wife were looking at houses and so forth, and of the 10 properties that we looked to rent, nine of those were owned by immigrants. And then not only did they own one home, to your point around, uh, you know, the housing market being a conduit to wealth creation, there was one uh, immigrant who was Russian she was a masseuse and she owned four houses as wow. a masseuse, which Must is crazy. Have a great right? Income as a masseuse. <laughs> well, you know, $150 a massage, that'll do it. <laughs> That's she's, do it. she's making like three, four grand a day if she's working eight hours a day. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. who knows? Um, but uh, I was really surprised at just how much. Uh, you know, property or private home ownership is used to create wealth. Not only that, but it's also obviously the backbone of the economy. And as you touched on right up front, you know, 2008 was a thing <laughs> which we all didn't enjoy uh, for a number of reasons. Um, I'm curious to 
uh, maybe stick with trends in property prices at the moment because and I'll come to what you're doing from a platform perspective, white labeling your technology to banks and so forth. But it seems to me you're sitting with a lot of inf insight and information uh, around the market currently. Um, I was listening to, I was in an Uber going to a meeting the other day um, and GDP growth uh, in the U.S. increased by 2.4% in the last quarter. 3.8 million jobs were created in the last 12 months. But the general consensus is it's kind of like a wait and see. The U.S. economy is in a bit of a holding pattern at the moment. What, what are you seeing uh, in terms of trends currently in the housing market in the U.S.? So, you know, I think that everyone is waiting certainly for another shoe to drop from a recession perspective, of course. And so there's a lot of that waiting in relation to, you know, just all of the macroeconomic drivers of, you know, whether it's inflation or interest rates or um, kind of the, the job reports that you've been seeing. I think that there is a lot, you know, I'm, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm an optimist by nature, I guess. Um, so take everything I say with a little bit of salt. Um, but I think there's a lot to be optimistic about because, um, as horrific as inflation and interest rate, you know, um, raises have been there so far, at least, you know, the stability of jobs in our economy has been, I think, a, a really strong, um, indicator, um, and in most, you know, scarier recessionary environments, you see job losses and income declines that, really relate to, to much more significant hardships among consumers than the rest um, that have just basically a much far bigger impact on the economy. And so, you know, I, I think like, you know, the job reports have generally been, I think, pretty, you know, without getting too, I don't know, linked into the the most recent one or the the next one or what have you. I think if you look at the broader picture, it's actually pretty strong. And that's a good thing for our economy, and it's something that that make, gives me some some you know specter of optimism, as well. Um, you also just kind of pointed out wealth creation by folks that own more than one home, and what what's really kind of intrinsic, like native to our housing environment, in a far larger percentage than ever before is really institutional home, home ownership. And so with this amount of wealth creation, of course, people that are attracted to are not just consumers, but also institutional wealth that that look to um, grow their wealth through, home, you know, real estate holdings and all the rest. Um, and so, you know, we've seen, you know, rising costs of home ownership as a result of that demand. And you know, I, I see that as much more of a supply and demand kind of uh, equation than anything else. Um, we as a nation just have not kept up with housing supply at all. Um, and if you look at the most valuable places to live, um, you know, the, the homeowners in those places, um, which are largely baby boomers, have basically defeated all proposals to add new housing inventory. Um, so if you look at places like Palo Alto or Boulder, Colorado, or, you know, close to us, or, you know, those types of places, there isn't, you know, we need thousands of new homes and locations like that. And thousands of new homes are not slated under construction in any of those areas. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it's kind of an interesting dynamic where, um, folks are independent of interest rates getting sort of priced out of the market that are, that are, should be in, you know, you know, home ownership at this point in their lives, because there's just not the construction and the supply side that's growing. Um, and as, as you know, the, the baby boomers have aged in place and not, you know, um, aged out of their homes, they're, 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 they tend to live in their homes even longer than expected. Um, it's not freeing up housing inventory like you would naturally have expected in the 70s or 80s or what have you. Um, so anyway, it's a supply and demand issue. We need a lot more supply to make home ownership affordable. Yeah, I was chatting to uh, Garrett Moore. He's the founder and CEO of Agoras uh, earlier this week, um, and he's built this startup, raised a lot of money to literally go and solve this problem that you described, where 
housing development or building hasn't kept up with the need for for housing and it's really interesting like if you go outside uh, denver towards parker Mm -hmm. um it's amazing to see that like there's entire blocks going up you know and i said to my wife the other day i'm like isn't it crazy to think like we're driving it's literally like to put it in perspective if you imagine literally like this massive like apartment block going up and there's nothing else around it you know what I mean? It's weird. Like you would expect like an apartment block to be going up in this in downtown Denver. Um and, and you know, like in three to three years time, five like the entire all that open land is gonna be built up. And even when it gets there, it's probably not gonna be enough no. to accommodate like And we need density. You know, we need it in downtown Denver and we need it along Colfax if you're looking at that area that's woefully underdeveloped and um all the rest. And you know, we you know, there's there's so much opportunity to redevelop a lot of these locations that, um, you know, would become quite central and easily to na- easy to navigate to jobs and recreation and all the rest. Um, but it's um, you know it's 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 fascinating. We you know those those that suburban development is also it's it's useful, but it doesn't get us there. It, we need both. We need urban and suburban development at this point, particularly because there's been such a trend towards an interest in living in a sort of a more modernized city where people where there is density and there you know you can um, get into work with you know less than an hour and a half commute and all the rest. And so um, you know it's um, you know we need both, and it's 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 woefully underdeveloped for sure. Mm-hmm. So uh, I'd love to come back to uh, what you've built. So um, you mentioned to me that you put $2.3 billion of mortgages uh, through your platform. You're the fastest lender in the country and the cheapest. So a typical mortgage production cost is around $5,000. You can do it for like $500. Um, and also you, said, you mentioned to me that the average turn time for underwriting is three weeks and you can do it in half a day. You mentioned that earlier too. So um, you built something truly remarkable. Uh, I'm curious to uh, unpack with you your kind of go-to-market fit strategy, if you like. Obviously, you kind of at some level of maturity already and scale already. But the white labeling strategy, what has the, um, the, the response been from incumbents, community banks, things like it's this, when they, when, they, when they come across something like that's like, holy shit, this is something we've never even in our wildest dreams <laughs> could have built ourselves, you know? So there, there certainly, you know, the lack of belief that it could be such a step function above what they're doing because it is so incredibly different. Um, but I would say a couple of things. One is that we don't really compete against any co- incumbent because they're so terrifically and horrifically bad. Um, so like the the incumbents in the industry um, were developed in the 90s. And their technology, if you just even saw it visually, you would know, you know, that mm-hmm. this is super antiquated, hilariously bad software that never was about automation or changing the process. In, instead, all of what was built back in the day was built to govern a manual process. So if somebody is punching, you know, information into a 10 key. I don't know if many of your viewers will even know what that is, um, but, you know, that's like the little calculator with the scrolly paper that comes out. Um, but anyway, if, if someone is punching, you know, your, your loan information into a 10 key, it was meant to govern that process to allow someone to then take all of the outputs of their manual calculations and put it into a database, really. Um, and what makes our software so sort of diff- incredibly and vastly different is that it's meant to replace all of that so that there are no calculations. You know, no one is actually calculating your income or assets. And what that does is make sure that you're consistently treated. So, you know, it doesn't matter if you're a minority or, you know, um, you are uh, from a same sex marriage or what have you. All of your calculations are consistently calculated, just like everyone else's are, so that you, when we get to your income number, not only is it consistent, but it's correct. And so um, that's that's kind of a big deal in my market um, because there's so many quality issues and so many problems with manual processes that lead to, 
you know, uh, huge bias and people not getting able to, you know, obtain housing and affordability and all the rest. And so long story short, in terms of receptivity of what we're doing, I think once folks see it, they understand why it's so different. Um, but it does require someone not just suspending belief, but actually just observing and evaluating the software through a demo to see, oh, this is vastly different than what we're doing. Um, what I would say is that because we're not fighting against incumbents and there isn't really a close second, we fight against the status quo. You know, our it doesn't matter what the status quo is or which company is providing core banking software to a bank or a non-bank lender. We're, you know, the status quo has incredible, incredible inertia in my industry. Um, people fear change for um, many, many reasons in this industry. Um, you know, it's a heavily regulated one. It, um, you know, and and even because there haven't been real improvements in productivity in my industry, like real meaningful ones, um, there's a tendency to doubt technology can actually deliver on its promise. So, you know, if in, in, in any industry, if in the last 30 years, your productivity has actually gotten worse, then it, there's the tendency to disbelieve that technology can be a solution, you know, um, to, to your problems. And so anyway, you know, I think that for us, it's all about education. It's all about making sure that bank executives know that there are better solutions out there, that if they evaluate this software, they can have higher quality, lower compliance risk, and get things done faster and cheaper. Um, not to mention all of, of course, the customer journey advantages that that come with, you know, naturally with a better process. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that's that's the idea is to basically educate bank executives one by one um, and show them, you know, demos of our software and why it's so meaningfully different. Mm -hmm. Um, so just to maybe change gears somewhat and, and talk about funding, you guys have closed your series B one round, uh, earlier this year, back in April. Um, you were also talking to me about, uh, venture capital list, not really understanding to some extent, like how you guys typically make money, uh, given where you are and the platform that you built and so on and so forth and the position that you take up in this on-ramp uh, in terms of lenders. Um, I'm curious to to stick with this lending conversation for, for a little while. Um, how did you find raising money in the market back, well, it's not even that too many months ago, four or five months ago, with the market being what it is, hyperinflation, et cetera, did you find it more harder than you expected? Walk us through what your experience was. The mortgage market is not sexy, you know, um, even in its best of years is not sexy. It's um, least understood by many people. There's lots of acronyms and odd words that describe what happens in the mortgage market. Um, and, be, and it's co complex and there's a lot going on in it um, with a lot of stakeholders involved in how, you know, mortgage gets made and then sold and serviced and all the rest. And because of that complexity, you know, um, the, there's been a lack of funding in my segment in particular that I guess cuts both ways. It both provides us with opportunity because we frankly don't have many competitors, um, strangely, in the world's biggest consumer finance market. Um, but also, you know, it cuts the opposite way when you're looking at capitalization and funding a company in this style of market. Um, the I would say that, you know, our um, the receptivity towards what we're doing today is much higher because venture groups tend to understand selling software. But the way we per, the way we created this great software is that we actually became a mortgage origination company. We became a mortgage lender, a licensed one that had to raise financing facilities to fund loans and, you know, all the rest. And that that complexity of our business model really challenged many, many venture groups who found it, um, they found that they weren't familiar with that landscape and you don't fund or capitalize, you know, 
people doing what you're unfamiliar with. Um, and so as a result, like we we really struggled over time to raise capital. Um, you know, we, you know, our series A, I think was our probably hardest round. Um, and it all, I, I think it is for a lot of groups when they're just moving from C to A and you've got a great proof point and you've got a great product. Um, but that, you don't just need a great proof point and great product. You need, you know, the capital source to understand what you're doing. Um, and so, um, you know, that, that was, that was hard. Um, there's, there's no doubt about it. Um, we, we also, um, you know, we, we also, I think, um, made a lot of good decisions early on about the style of team we wanted to build and how much we cared about our own culture in building something this hard. Um, and sometimes that bit us when it came to funding um, because we, we didn't exactly look for, like if you look at, um, if you look at some groups, even in my segment, um, you'll you'll see that you know the folks that tend to get funded are have um, kind of crazy background stories of um, you know prior successes in other markets or they have you know um, you know interesting backgrounds from Ivy League schools and all the rest and we we you know built a team that wasn't just based on where did you go to school or you know the the Ivy League character side of things but also your character and whether you're you know a good person and whether you're kind to your teammates and all the rest um and sometimes that made us um a lot you know make harder decisions in terms of who we we maintained on our team um and all the rest that that really um you know that we where we could have accelerated, for example, sales traction faster if we didn't keep our team kind and you know wonderful to each other and all the rest. Um, that that really led to to us having more of a hard time, you know, raising funds candidly. Um, and so anyway, long story short, is I think we made the right decisions over time to to sort of double down on culture um, and make sure we were building the right team. Um, even in the face of, you know, what the requirements were, the hurdle rates that, that, that we were seeing in terms of growth or what have you from, from venture groups. Um, you know, I, I think I told you kind of that interesting story where we, we actually ran out of capital prior to our A, you know, we had a failed series A, um, because we we're making kind of hard choices about sales team members and all the rest. Um, and our, our series A actually, which was, um, kind of in the bag um failed and when that series a failed um we um we suddenly found ourselves instead of you know pushing on growth and stomping on that pedal suddenly closing down the entire company um you know we we laid 100 percent of our staff off um and it was such a hard time to be so close to building something and just pulling it all apart, you know, and destroying it. Um, and so we laid off everyone on December, I think, 5th or something like that. Um, and I had a holiday party that week and every single employee came to this holiday party. And um, it was just one of the most meaningful experiences that I've ever had in my professional career. People were crying and laughing and you know, enjoying, you know, what they had in this journey. And what was interesting is like, it just felt like an unfinished project. It felt incredibly important and it felt unfinished. And um, meanwhile, my, my wife had this massive health issue. She had brain cancer and it was her first surgery. And so she was going to go under the knife and have this eight hour awake craniotomy and all the rest. And I found myself, you know, every one of my team members was saying, We'll wait for you to put this back together. We'll wait for you to grow capital. We won't take other long-term jobs, and we'll we'll put this back together. And I and I kept telling them, no, this is over. You know, I was not trying to lead them along that that road. Um, but you know, they they led me there, and so that's that's really the point of that story is that sometimes your team leads you there, and um, so. I ended up acquiring another company that was cash flow positive and came with family investment to capital recapitalize NEAT. 
um, while my wife was learning to speak again in the emergency room or the ICU or what have you. And it worked out so that every single person rejoined NEAT in January. Hmm. And the level of passion, commitment, and love that you build out of those hard situations can be even greater than if everything had been a smooth and easy journey. Um, so I, you know, I think that as hard as those moments were, and they were brutal, um, I think we built a much, much better company out of it. Yeah, it seems that way. And I think what I'm curious to maybe double click on is why? <laughs> Because it wasn't like two did, you know what I mean? Of the, like, of the 24, like, it wasn't like 10% of them did. It was all of them, like, or at least, you know, pretty much all of them. What do you put that down to? Because, uh, you know, I, I get that you focused on culture, but within that context, why do you think they stuck it out? Because you kind of like said, hey, man, it's over, right? And then on top of all of that, you had, you know, your personal situation with your wife. I mean, you must have been going through hell at that time. Um, and so for them to all come back, you know what I mean? Like when that when you finally lifted your head up and like, hey, cool, let's see what we can do. They all came back. Like, why is that? Because my experience is, is like people in many cases will only be loyal to you so long as you're paying them a, a paycheck. Oh, you that know? was not our team because they weren't all earn, earning a paycheck even after. But um, so, so yeah, I, I think um, that's such a good question. And um, I don't have a good answer for you, but I would say that... Um, <laughs> that uh, human beings make decisions like, and, and you have to imagine, put yourself in this, in the shoes of the person making this decision who was just laid off before Christmas time, who has to tell that. And many of these people were not just 23. They were, you know, they had family members that they were the sole breadwinner for and all the rest. And they had to go tell, talk to their spouse and their kids and say, you know, even though I was just laid off by this, you know, crazy group, I'm going to rejoin, you know, and, um, the, you know, until you've been in those conversations, you don't realize like how, how that's not just like a flippant, you know, I'll try that out again, you know, and developers get a job the next day, you know, they were incredibly talented people with wonderful backgrounds and great resumes that could have easily had a job at Google or any other great, great employer. Um, so it wasn't out of desperation at all. Um, I would say, though, that there were a couple of things going for us. Uh, one is that we loved each other. And that sounds so trite and weird and whatever, but we really enjoyed each other. Um, and we respected each other and we were learning from each other. Um, that's such a big thing when you're building something to be learning from each other, to like listen and learn and you know, enjoy, you know, building not just a career, but something that is, that is, you know, hard and, you know, seeing, seeing someone make it better that's working alongside of you. Um, that's just such a unique experience that can't be, I don't think, measured in comp. Um, and so, and then the, the other thing is that I think that the team actually did care about its impact on consumers. You know, it's so weird that you cannot go to a bank in the country and find out how much income you need for a loan amount. That is out of, this is the, the, the segment that ruined the, the entire global economy because we were predatory lending to people that couldn't afford their homes. And there is zero, and I mean zero consumer education in the mortgage process. And so I think there was a bit of like, let's, let's the, the crusading sort of, let's make this better for people because it does matter. Um, and then the last bit of it was that, um, you know, yeah, I, it's, it's that again, when you worked so darned hard on something and it is such a step function above what's in the industry and it's an unfinished product, there's a nagging feeling that it could have been this amazing thing. You know, there's mm. like, you know, when you've worked that hard on something, you do care about it. And I know that the economist in me says that's a sunk cost 
that who cares what you've put into it. It doesn't matter how many blood, how many ounces of blood or sweat or tears you put into a product. It it does matter though personally, you know, when when you see when you see what it can be. And so I think that kept people together. Um, it was a hard problem worth solving that was that we wanted to actually see through. Mm. Yeah, it's an amazing story that, um, and I think you know you should be re you should be really proud that that's the choice that they made. You know what I mean, amongst everything. And I think this is also I think one of the key things there is like the importance of a mission, and like the vision, and, and that's where I want to go now is like the, in terms of your vision. Obviously, these uh, staff members of yours that were you know put out to pasture came back because of this mission. So, what is the ultimate vision, uh, Luke, that you see? Uh, for this company and for your team. So there's there's so much there, but we we of course want to be the core banking platform in the country for mortgage. We want to um, and but but you know that's that sounds like that's not a very interesting visionary statement. Um, what we to what we are really interested in is is of course you know in in our mission statement or uh, has. Um, is kind of unique in that it actually puts the consumer at the center of that. It doesn't put a bank at the center of that. It doesn't put a loan officer or a salesperson at the center of it. it. Doesn't put capital markets groups at the center of it. It puts the consumer at the center of that journey, and says, "What can we do to make their their experience, you know, um, you know, uh, basically?" So I'm not going to read out our mission statement because nobody will care that's not inside of needs, but it it's educational, free of surprises and frictionless. You know, how do we make that consumer journey that awesome? And of course, when you do that for the consumer, you make the back office seamless. You know, of course, when you do that for the consumer, you bring down costs to the industry. Of course, when you do that for the consumer, you you reduce, you know, the the bad loans credit risk you know the you know when when people only buy homes they can afford that is not a bad thing you know um and so anyway there's there's so much to be done there to actually see that through especially when we when we work through the change management process to ensure that banks don't just see this as a prospective solution but advocate for it internally and embrace it and look forward to actually changing and disrupting the way they do things. Um, and so there's there's a lot that we're doing, not just to make that software journey work for the consumer, but also all of the stakeholders involved so that they they can understand and embrace why this this brings such a meaningful difference to so many people. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, I want to have a bit of fun with you, uh, Luke, um, and uh, play a bit of a game. So if I gave you the keys to the Matt, to the Matt Brown Show time machine, um, and you could go back to yourself on day one of building uh, Need Labs, what advice would you give yourself uh, about building this business? Oh, geez. There's so much. Um, <laughs> you know, you, you can't help but learn the hard way through so many things. And I don't, you know, I, I, that I actually would go back to, you know, something that we just talked about, which is even if we could have avoided all of those failures along the way, the question is, would we? Would we be as good of a company now if we hadn't had that story? If we hadn't iterated, if we hadn't learned from our failures along the journey, would we would would we arrived at the same point we're at, you know, in in terms of both the, um, the you know the 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 product we've built, um, as well as the team we've built, um, and so there's so much advice I'd have about you know of course not wasting time with um, groups that can't move quickly um, in in any um, financing, you know, like if. If you're talking to a venture group that needs four months to evaluate what you're doing, you're talking to the wrong group. Do not waste your time. It's not worth it. Um, 
and they can pass on something they knew on day one. And the type of group that takes four months to do something is very, very apt to do that. Um, so I would say, you know, if if you value speed and like, I, I think it's a reciprocal equation where venture groups value speed in your growth trajectory and you should value speed in their ability to execute on, you know, in capitalizing your business. And so I certainly wouldn't have wasted time there because I don't see a value add in doing that. Um, but I, but outside of that, I would in internally, I think that we're a better company because we've iterated, because we've failed, because we've been challenged and we we haven't actually been capital flush along, along the way which has made us be much more thoughtful and much more strategic about what we've done and when um and so all of those constraints sometimes build something that is better they do i love constraints because it forces innovation <laughs> it's like... that's right i mean that's i mean there's a, a funny you know definition for entrepreneurship where it's like you know, um, I think it's like accessing resources beyond your direct control or something like that. Um, it's like the old Harvard, you know, business school case study definition of, of entrepreneurship. And we've thought a lot about that throughout the journey. We've had to be incredibly creative because we didn't have, you know, access to immense capital. Um, you know, a funny little story early on is that we, you know how in my industry, everybody follows each other like lemmings, you know, whether it's off a cliff or not. Um, we knew that going in. And so we we also were, we didn't have like hundreds of millions of dollars of capitalization to fund these loans, but you can't fund loans until you do. And nobody will give you approvals to buy your loans or to provide the financing facilities unless other people are involved. And it's just like this big chicken and egg problem. So anyway, we, we got an approval from a group that was going out of business <laughs> um, because, and we said to them, basically, we will never send you a loan. We're not interested in selling you loans, but we need you to approve us because you're a big group in the industry that everyone else takes seriously. <laughs> and so we got this <laughs> approval done. Um, and no one knew that they were, of course, you know, insolvent or going out of business or what have you. But it was hugely meaningful for us getting traction with other sponsors that were willing to buy our product. Um, and so we just found creative ways to do it along the way. Um, and, and it was interesting. We got better relationships out of that than if we had just kind of, I don't know, got, gone about it in the traditional way. Amazing. Well, look, uh, so much of your story is, is, is amazing, <laughs> not only because of the difference that you're making, but also because of the struggles that you've been through. So, uh, congratulations on all your success. You've raised, you know, 40 to 50 million odd, uh, that's a huge achievement, um, and very excited to see where you guys are going to go in the future. So thank you for being on the show. Thanks, Matt. Really appreciate it. It was a fun conversation. Take care. Anytime. Cheers, everyone. Awesome.